All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jan. Um, about uh, 10 years ago, I was sitting in the classroom uh, learning stuff. And in the past uh, 10 years, a ton of stuff has happened. And one of the things that I think uh, was really important to me uh, in the past 10 years is really thinking a lot about scalability and how to grow things. Um, and um, so uh, I put in a course proposal for scalable web software, uh, which was approved. And, and here I am teaching this for the first time. So uh, please forgive me if um, uh, you know, I'm a little bit uh, rusty at this. I've uh, lectured uh, in the past, but never done a, a quarter-long course. So um, I'd love for you guys to um, help me make the course as good as possible. And um, so I'll just get through the administrative stuff quickly. Um, as I mentioned, my name's Jan. Um, we've got uh, two CAs for the class. Uh, Aditya's here. Uh, sitting in the second row. And uh, Ed is actually uh, going to be uh, arriving on campus on Friday, so you'll get to meet him next week. Um, I'm going to try and ha have make myself as available as possible virtually, um, but um, I'll, I'll also figure out you know, when's a good time for um, people to meet me in person uh, to talk about stuff. Um, because uh, actually, I, I end up... Uh, preferring uh, seeing people in person myself. Uh, I get to know them better, and I get to understand a lot better um, you know, uh, what you can and can't do. Um, I've put up a, a web page for the, the class, um, and you can find it in the usual spot. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, try to make uh, the, the PDFs of all of these lectures uh, available there uh, to download on a weekly basis or so. Um, so, uh, um, I guess the best thing for me to do now is just to start uh, diving in. Um, so the motivation for the course, as I mentioned before, is that uh, I have spent the past 10 years working um, on web software, and I've run into all sorts of interesting problems. Uh, both, uh, you know, scaling software and scaling myself and scaling the teams that I worked with um, during the course of those 10 years. And I think that part of the reason that, you know, this issue is, has become so much more important now than it was in the past is that the web um, is uh, an incredible um, sort of infrastructure for, for scalability. Um, and we've never had anything really like it uh, to experiment with up until now. And uh, so um, for me, uh, you know, teaching this class is an opportunity to share my experiences and hopefully uh, introduce you to things that uh, have worked in the past and, and may work in the future, and, and also an opportunity to talk about things that uh, uh, haven't worked up until now and probably won't work in the future either. <laughs> Um, and uh, in particular, um, one of the things I'd like to relate you, to you is that uh, when I submitted the course proposal in March last year, uh, I, I was thinking, you know, uh, scalable web software, that's, you know, pretty current. And considering how much stuff is happening in the mobile space right now, I'm definitely feeling that uh, uh, at some level, uh, my course title's already a little bit dated. So... Um, uh, I'd also like to keep the material in the course relevant to uh, what you might be doing uh, in the next few years. And I think the, the mobile web and, and uh, mobile as a, a, a platform is actually uh, growing extremely quickly and is, is going to rapidly start dominating. Um, so uh, my goal is to get you guys to think big about stuff. And... Uh, and what I thought would be really fun, instead of having people do a lot of individual projects where um, you're not really ever in contact with the material that uh, your other classmates uh, produce, I'd like to uh, experiment with the idea of building an open source website as a team and just um, getting people to work on uh, projects 
that um, can be fairly you know, well contained, but uh, can communicate with the projects that other, uh, that other students are, are um, uh, producing. And uh, so the reason for that is that I, I really felt that uh, I wanted um, to look at scaling not just from the perspective of writing software um, um, that works on thousands of machines, but also writing software that works well in the larger context, uh, you know, across a lot of different uh, bits of code. And uh, also, um, you know, helping uh, sort of develop engineering practices that let you as an individual integrate well into teams, um, both if you want to create your teams yourself or if you end up joining a larger company and uh, need to adapt quickly to what's going on uh, within that environment. And um, so my, my big thought for this slide is that, you know, uh, if, if this course goes well, um, we, we're writing software that scales from the laptop to the cloud stuff that you can write and test and run on your laptop, uh, but also, uh, you know, pretty easily just uh, release to a cloud-based system and r l allow it to run for lots of people. Um, so <clears throat> on, a w on a weekly basis, I'd like to sort of cover topics that I think are, you know, most relevant to scalability um, in web programming. And it's, again, not just about getting your software to run on thousands of computers at once, but really it's about um, building systems that uh, last over time. And uh, those systems actually include also perhaps the, the companies you might found. <laughs> um, so the first week, uh, we're going to focus specifically on scalability and what it means to me. Uh, and how, how I've observed it in the companies that I've been a part of and, uh, and uh, in general um, in uh, all of the companies that I've had a chance to sort of observe over the course of 10 years. I'd like to look at uh, agile practices um, early on just because I think it's a, a good idea um, to sort of motivate some of the scalability issues for uh, individuals and teams and then kind of start digging into uh, actual uh, code and um, the, the, the areas that where I think scalability is going to um, be most Im impactful for you. Um, so the uh, third, fourth, and fifth weeks are going to be pretty concrete. Uh, the first one about uh, APIs and connecting to other people's code. Um, the reason I put it early on is because I think that if you have a little bit of experience looking at other people's APIs, it can help also in uh, communicating with some of your classmates on the projects they're working on and how to connect your code to theirs. Um, and then we'll look at scalability in the client, on the browser, um, in uh, databases, and on the server side. And then we're going to start looking at some of the topics that I think um, are, you know, germane to making those uh, even uh, more scalable over time. Um, security and privacy is one area that is getting a lot of discussion right now on the web. Um, and there's a lot of things to think about up front with regards to security and privacy when really at the outset when you're starting out development. Um, Analytics, uh, one of the things I think that's most important here is that uh, if you're measuring what your software does very carefully, um, you actually have exactly the right kind of data that will allow you to s discover how to make uh, your service grow, uh, get more users, um, uh, uh, have higher, higher profitability if you're uh, putting ads on your site uh, or increase sales, etc. So I think analytics is tremendously relevant to scalability, um, although you might not have thought so before stepping into this classroom. <laughs> um, and, uh, and towards the end of the class, I really want, uh, and uh, the, the end of the quarter, I want to focus on the future and you know, where you can take the stuff that you've uh, done during the course of the quarter. So um, I'd like to stop 
for just a second and see if there are any questions. Um, and if not, I'll just continue. But uh, is the pacing generally OK? All right. Cool. All right. So there's really going to be um, three projects uh, in, in the class. Uh, one is a very small one about building unit tests and writing a little code to make those unit tests pass. Um, the bigger project uh, is listed under four. Uh, will be one where you choose uh, a particular project uh, concept and work together with maybe one or two other people. And that's going to be the, the, the main coding focus in the class. And then the last one listed under five here is uh, going to be an integration uh, project where uh, basically you try to figure out you know, which other projects you'd like to uh, connect your code to and uh, um, take a look at you know, what kind of functionality you can accomplish uh, through that integration. Uh, the other two that I've listed here, one and three, are really not projects per se, but um, they're going to consume a little bit of the, uh, the time in the class because I think that they're actually uh, really uh, useful, again, in uh, scaling yourself as a coder uh, um, and uh, perhaps uh, your team as you move along into the main project. So... Um, now I'm going to step back a little bit uh, from that concrete stuff and just think a little bit about scale in a very abstract way. Um, you may have already seen uh, websites such as the, the Power of Ten uh, talk about the scale of the universe and talk about the scale of the very smallest things in the universe. Well, to me it's actually very interesting that um, the human scale, if you set us to one, is you know, somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, of the smallest things and the largest things. And uh, when you think about it, uh, an individual unaided human can actually operate in about one, one fifth of the feasible range of these powers of 10 um, um, you know, without resorting to uh, you know, equipment or machines to help you uh, do any more than that. So that's, that's interesting in and of itself to me. Um, but what, what actually I started thinking about a little bit um, was how technology has uh, affected this picture. And um, so I've put up about five little examples here of how technology has, has stretched man's ability to uh, uh, basically deal with things that are both extremely small and things that are extremely large. Um, the first one I'll mention, which is maybe the most obscure to a lot of you, is the Itaipu. Uh, it's a huge hydroelectric power plant. It's actually the, uh, currently the most powerful power plant in the world. And um, uh, it'll soon be passed uh, by the Three Gorges Dam in China. Um, and it actually is about uh, equal to the... Uh, power production of um, 10 million humans all at once. So if you got 10 million humans um, you know, riding on uh, bicycles at 24-hour fitness, you might be able to produce the amount of power of uh, this giant dam. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, it's about <coughs> twice as powerful as the largest nuclear power plant. Um, but uh, the, the problem with uh, hydroelectric power is that um, it depends on having large rivers to dam, and there's only so many of them. At any rate, 10 million humans uh, uh, equals one Itaipu. Um, Google recently uh, was mentioned as having c uh, managing about one exabyte of data. And uh, if you look at the human brain, it has about 10 to the power 11 neurons. So I just did a, a calculation where I said uh, one neuron equals one bit and uh, you know, divided the Google's exabyte by our uh, 10 to the 11 neurons. And uh, Google's basically managing um, 100 million times 
the number of bits in some sense that uh, our neurons manage. So it's just, uh, it's a back of the envelope calculation, but I think it's still instructive to sort of think about it from that perspective. And then NASA, uh, the Voyager 1 spacecraft, uh, is basically about 10 to the 13 times farther away than uh, humans generally move on their own. <laughs> um, so, uh, and there's nothing else uh, that's farther uh, from, you know, where it started than the Voyager 1 spacecraft. Um, and then on the, side, on the side of very small things, um, in, Intel's latest processors use a, a, a process that's about 100 million times smaller than um, uh, the types of things that humans generally work with uh, manually. And uh, IBM uh, was the sort of, in, uh, or researchers at IBM invented the atomic force microscope and have moved individual atoms into patterns and, and actually uh, the scale of those designs are on the order of 10 to the minus 11. Um, so uh, compared to what we usually work with. So anyway, uh, technology has effectively, you know, uh, doubled our reach if you f think about the Google and Intel examples because they make it available to just about any of us. Um, in research, we've actually been able to get almost to about triple our original reach. But um, there is one, one interesting <laughs> uh, aspect to all of this, and that is that it's going to be very hard to make progress any further in those directions because uh, we're getting pretty close to um, the limits of what we can easily handle uh, on Earth. Uh, on the small side because um, you start getting into, into uh, the, the, qu the classical limits and working with quantum particles. Um, and on the large side because uh, it's very difficult to you know, move a lot of people off planet. So, um, so we're kind of, uh, when, when I talk about scale and scalability, uh, my, my instinct is to talk really about like uh, extending your reach you know, being a force multiplier to whatever it is you can do. And I just wanted to provide a, a very, you know, uh, per big perspective on uh, what that means uh, as far as humanity is concerned. Um, and I think it's somewhat relevant to what we're, we're hoping to accomplish during the course. Um, so getting back to uh, the class, uh, you know, scalability matters to me because the internet is, at some level, a giant megaphone. And um, if you look at the blogosphere, it's an even more powerful megaphone in some sense relative to its size. But uh, the, um, the web is an incredible medium for uh, expressing yourself and, and communicating to a, a, an unexpectedly large number of people. And uh, if you build software that has good word of mouth, uh, it'll grow fast, and that growth um, at least um, up until a certain point looks a lot like an exponential function. So, you know, if you're doubling in size every month, um, you, start ha you start to have to think about, you know, how do I get extra servers or how do I, you know, get a, an IT team to help manage this or whatever. And um, a, lot of, a lot of companies run into problems dealing with that runaway growth. Um, and so I think this is uh, the, one of the real reasons that I want to spend some time on all the different aspects of scalability. Um, many software processes are brittle. Um, they don't really hold up very well to this kind of growth. Um, especially, you know, a lot of companies go from having, you know, a couple founders to maybe, you know, 10 engineers to a couple hundred or a couple thousand engineers as they grow. And uh, it effectively becomes very difficult to manage um, all the code for all of those different pro projects and things that a company is doing as it grows that fast. Um, and, uh, you know, lastly, if you're more entrepreneurial, um, investors tend to expect big returns on whatever it is you do. So um, 
you have to think of it from the perspective of uh, you know producing something that your partners or or investors are going to be happy with, and uh, so uh, getting as many eggs in your basket as possible early on does help. <laughs> um, I spent. Uh, about a year and a half working at Napster, and Napster was a really interesting place to see uh, what did and didn't work um, in software scalability. Um, so I wanted to put sort of an, an unexpected piece of information at the top there. N not only was it a uh, you know, music download system, it was a, an instant messaging client at its peak. And uh, it, it easily outstripped uh, all of the other instant messaging <coughs> clients like uh, AOL Instant Messenger or Yahoo uh, at its peak also in terms of simultaneous users. So um, the, the uh, interest in music was so high and people were connecting to, to each other through the software so much that uh, even after the music was gone, um, the Napster Instant Messenger um, what had you know hundreds of thousands of users logging in just to talk to the friends that they'd made uh, while they were looking for music. Um, so to me, that's kind of an, an interesting and curious stat. Uh, the architecture was very scalable. Um, at at the peak, there were you know on the order of two to three hundred servers uh, supporting uh, you know up to about ten thousand users on a single server at at any given time. And, uh, you know, servers would fall over, but, uh, you know, you'd restart them, you'd, you'd put another one up, and uh, people were back in business. So uh, it, it worked incredibly well. And uh, it's a big contrast to uh, Twitter if you think about how often Twitter is generally unavailable to people. Um, uh, so... Uh, you know, ten, well, almost 10 years ahead of Twitter, you know, Napster was doing stuff that, that worked really well for its users. Um, the other thing that was interesting from a scalability perspective was that uh, the Napster client um, provided the illusion of ubiquity. Um, and what I mean by that is that, the, that when you used the Napster client, it really looked like every single possible piece of music you could imagine was on it even if that wasn't really the case. Um, there was just so much there that it, it covered basically 90% of what any given individual knew was out there. Um, and, um, that, you know, that was just really remarkable. Um, on, on the downside, um, Napster had uh, a Windows client, they had a Mac client, they had an internal um, Linux client, um, and they had a, a server team that were all disconnected from each other and were actually implementing the same protocol uh, each separately on all platforms. So, um, so this was an example of you know, a dev team that was put together really fast and they were really good coders. You know, they knew how to do a lot of stuff, but they didn't really know how to uh, integrate their work very well with everyone else's. And um, uh, actually, only at the, the very end of Napster's life cycle as a company uh, did they get their act together and get um, uh, the protocol down to a single uh, XML file, and, uh, uh, which then was something that we could generate the, the source code for on each platform. Um, anyway, this had major... Uh, release schedule impacts. Uh, everything was delayed because things were, you know, working on one platform but not on the other, etc. And I think that uh, it was one of the things that uh, really slowed Napster down beyond just uh, the legal problems that the company had uh, toward the end of the existence of the company. And um, so, um, you know, this is, this is definitely a, an example where um, my personal experience, I hope, uh, can help you uh, avoid things like this in the future. <laughs> um, so going, going from that, that real-world example, uh, I'd like to look at um, sort of uh, a contrast between, you know, what business people and investors might think of 
in terms of sca scalability and you know products and the way uh, we might look at products and scalability uh, as engineers and scientists and so I came up with a, a couple slides that just diagram that to a certain extent and uh, use and I'm going to use those well in particular the visual perspective of innovation throughout the, the course to motivate uh, a number of things and in this class in particular I'll talk a little bit about uh, agile practices so um, I've for fun just put together a, a typical kind of slide that uh, you might show investors if you're an entrepreneur and it's a, a you know matrix um, that splits the space into quadrants and uh, those quadrants really separate, you know, whether you have feature one and feature two or not. And um, a lot of investors are really uh, understand this type of slide really well. Um, you know, it, it, it shows that, you know, your software is way better than everybody else's because of feature one and feature two. And um, so uh, the mindset here is that you're you're demonstrating um, sort of uniqueness and differentiation from your peers by uh, by this graph but from the engineering perspective on the other hand the the space really looks a lot more oh actually and and uh, investors also like uh, slides that show revenue that looks uh -huh. go ahead the bottom left corner so basically the the absence of either feature so it's it's these quadrants really represent whether a feature exists in the in the software or not like or the like well these are actually different software products oh. so so for instance my my product is in the top right there and my competitors are all arrayed around the the edges because they they basically just aren't nearly as cool and as awesome as mine and they lack all the features that made my software so much better um, so, um, yeah, investors also like to look at revenue slides, and uh, revenue slides typically look like uh, these really nice exponential curves. And uh, it, um, you have to you have to figure out how to uh, to actually accomplish that in reality. Um, because uh, ultimately your investors are going to start wondering what happens, you know, three years down the road when you might not have reached that number. Um, and so looking at it from the, the engineering perspective, on the other hand, you know, uh, the space actually, to me, looks a lot more like this. Um, when you're innovating, um, you're really thinking about the things that that you know you know, the things that you learned in school, the things you've accomplished already, and you're presenting an idea of a project that is outside of the things that you know you know. And it's basically in this very much larger space of things that we don't know we don't know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and really for an engineer, uh, I think the whole the whole process of innovation is uh, is about uh, staking a claim to a spot in in an area um, that ends up being squarely out in the space of things that you don't know you don't know you can describe it but you, there's really not much else you can do than uh, other than describe it uh, these other quadrants that I put here are the things you know you don't know and the things that you don't know that you know um, and so your goal is to really build some software that's out here um, and um, build a company that can actually build that software. And um, a priori, when you start designing a, um, a development schedule, you might imagine it to look something like this. You know, there's all sorts of uh, things that you might, you know, uh, plan in advance to... Um, to actually, you know, write that code, um, but what it ends up looking like <laughs> very frequently is something much more convoluted. Um, basically, uh, you know, if you were to if you were to look at 
uh, at this point, um, with the things that you knew when you started the project, it might look like you had just bounced back and forth between all sorts of different things as you were trying to get to your goal. Um, for me, actually, um, there's a, a saying uh, which kind of uh, expresses this pretty well, and that is that hindsight is 20-20. Uh, typically, when, once you've arrived somewhere, you can, you can always explain uh, the steps you took to get to um, um, where you are now. And in, in fact, so if you actually achieve this, uh, your hindsight represents some kind of a smooth curve back to where you were before. But, um, but in practice, uh, at the outset, when you're starting out, um, there's so many uh, variables that are hard to predict that um, uh, your path to your goal may end up looking a lot more convoluted than the nice smooth curve that I presented. Um, and so for me, um, kind of thinking about innovation and, and creating something new um, and having, having gone through the process several times, um, the thing that, I, that I've seen that has helped me get to um, where I am is a set of practices that um, I'm going to talk about uh, right now. And basically, um, I'm a, a big fan of uh, uh, agile practices. And what I found uh, to be really useful there is that um, those practices tend to be open uh, and accepting of new things from uh, you know, all different sources. And uh, they, build, they always build on uh, what was there before. Um, and uh, they're, they're adaptive to where you are at any given time, and they're fast, so that um, if you make mistakes, you can correct them quickly and move on and get to the next important things. Um, so uh, in my experience developing software, when we were releasing on a weekly or daily basis uh, our software, we were actually making the most headway um, in terms of feature set, in terms of you know, user uh, engagement, uh, and in terms of uh, growth of the, the services that I belong to. So for me, uh, actually reducing the amount of time between uh, releasable software is something that uh, actually is very uh, adaptive and powerful. Um, and it, it'll, get to, it'll get you to where, what you want to achieve a lot faster. Um, those processes tend to be social. They, they really um, use all of the tools um, that are available to software developers as communication tools. Um, so um, I found that the you know unit testing was a great way to tell people uh, in your development team about what worked and what didn't and what the conditions for code working and not code uh, or code not working was um, that your uh, uh, your issue tracker also allowed you to it was a form of communication between the outside world and and the development team and that um, by and large all of the different pieces of software that you might use while uh, developing your code uh, could be used to uh, really uh, speed up the development process and um, reduce the number of mistakes that, you, that you'd make in the future. Um, those processes are iterative. Uh, you know, daily, weekly iterations uh, are just... Um, incredibly valuable. Uh, I've, I've worked with companies that have, you know, released software on a quarterly basis. I've worked with companies that have released software on a daily basis. And um, the, the, the difficult thing for a lot of companies is to get to the point where their um, release process is smooth enough uh, to support such a fast release schedule. But once you have it, it's, it's unbelievable how much more you can accomplish. Um, and then lastly, these processes uh, tend to be sustainable. 
um, you know, if you, make a, if you make a mistake, you really don't want to make that mistake uh, again down the road. You, you really like to um, find yourself in a situation where you've documented uh, those mistakes in such a way that they catch them, that you catch them um, in the future before they, they, before they bite you again. Um, and uh, so I have experience building um, like an, an Ajax site that um, uh, was basically all, you know, all coded, all hand coded JavaScript. And since we didn't have a really good unit testing environment, we keep uh, producing the same bugs over and over again on a, on a weekly basis. And, you know, it, it was uh, an incredible engineering resource drain to find ourselves uh, looking at, at the same bugs over and over again. And uh, so definitely, you know, kind of thing that um, makes a, a really big difference is uh, the, a process that uh, lets you not forget everything that you learned <laughs> um, in your previous iterations. Okay. So, um, Getting back to the course and, uh, and the things that we're going to look at in the course in particular, um, I'm going to start off looking at scalability science a little bit and looking at how people scale and how processes scale a little bit. And then uh, we'll be digging into um, the various types of uh, scalability that you, uh, your software components have. And we'll look at the various types of uh, tools and APIs that, that really uh, help you achieve scalability in a large number of um, uh, different configurations. And um, I've put in a couple things that aren't specifically related to, um, uh, you know, the actual code itself. I put revenue, for instance. Um, the, the company I founded, iMeme, uh, was recently acquired by MySpace. And the reason it was acquired was because, uh, unfortunately, our um, our revenue model wasn't scalable. <laughs> so you know, um, you know, we got to the point where uh, we just couldn't do it on our own. Um, even though we'd been able to uh, increase advertising revenue dramatically, it was still not enough to offset the costs of the licenses with the labels and uh, all the other costs of running the service. So uh, I do want to, you know, keep bringing up those types of topics during the, uh, the course of the quarter because I think that they're extremely useful in motivating um, uh, some of the things that we're going to be doing and some of the choices that we make along the way. Um, so I put a big list of software here and my CA Aditya met, said that this might scare you away. Uh, please don't uh, <laughs> uh, please don't worry too much about this. This is really just a, a big laundry list of software, um, and you'll probably not be looking at all of these, but uh, a sampling. The ones that you'll probably uh, all be seeing are the development ones, and uh, some of the deployment ones, and maybe one each at least from the client, server, and cloud uh, areas. But uh, I, I wanted to, you know, you know, from the get-go kind of list a number of things that we were going to talk about and um, sort of just mention, you know, different kinds of software that you might want to interface with uh, in building your projects. Um, so, uh, I don't know. Are there any questions on this slide? Sure. Are we free to use our alternative Well, so that, that's a really good question. Um, there, there are courses that, that touch on web development at Stanford that uh, use Ruby on Rails, for instance, and uh, discuss how to you know, code directly in JavaScript. Um, I'm going to really try focusing on, um, on the kind of Java, GWT, um, and App Engine model, because I think it's an interesting one to explore. Uh, and I think that it actually provides a lot of scalability features that the other ones 
uh, don't. Uh, so I, I will try and motivate that choice. Uh, I, I definitely want you to feel free to you know, work with other uh, tools and, and things, but uh, I think that um, I feel you know, that once, once Google released the GWT package that all of a sudden you know, Java became a really interesting language to, uh, to develop on for the web uh, again because you could use it both on the server side and the client side. Um, and, and it basically allowed for all of the, the good processes that I've been thinking about in the last decade to, to sort of be more easily implemented. Um, uh, and just as a, uh, as an, yeah, go ahead. So like, if you started another company, would you be using these tools? Yes. So, <laughs> as a point of note, actually, most of the coding, most of the coding that I've done uh, in, in startups uh, the last six years has been in .NET, um, and I think .NET's a great platform too. But it, it's sort of in, there are certain inherent limitations in .NET that we can <laughs> that we can talk about. But part of it is just that um, you, you just don't have as much. Um, ability to explore what other people have done in the space. You know, you're kind of locked in to the tools that Microsoft gives, gives you. And um, so um, I think .NET's great. It's, it's not a, it, it just, it, it lacks a few things that I think um, makes the best software practices work uh, as, as well as they possibly can. Um, yeah, how do you Briefly explain, how do you justify using GWT at App Engine versus like partitioning the applications so that you use something like jQuery uh, or like some of these other technologies like you say? Like, that, that doesn't, I don't know if that's really that mainstream out there compared to what other people are doing. Yeah, so, so this is definitely at, at some level uh, an experimental course. There's some uh, unsolved problems with using, say, App Engine and uh, GWT. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, as an example, um, it's it's not uh, particularly convenient uh, to to do SEO uh, work with uh, a GUIT-based application. So, if you want uh, your your GWT application to to score high on on Google search rankings, um, you're kind of out of luck right now. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, you know, Google's own search engine doesn't handle uh, good applications that well. So that's an example of a, of a somewhat unsolved problem. Um, so in your viewpoint, what's the advantage of using GWT versus just JavaScript libraries? Well, so for me, these are all great questions, by the way. <laughs> um, so for me, one of the things that I th I think is is great about GUIT is that it allows you to develop both your server and client side uh, code or browser side code in Java, and you don't have to deal with a lot of cross compatibility issues. So um, you know, in when you're especially so you know I I always have considered myself a JavaScript amateur, and so I I always tend to write JavaScript that runs on the browser that I test with. And um, I hate debugging JavaScript on other browsers. Um, with GWT, you don't have that particular issue. But you can always also write a GWT overlay for any of the JavaScript libraries that you're talking about as well. So. <coughs> yeah. Um, so um, the, the the thing that I guess the the other thing that that is really important there is that you can uh, unit test your GWT code. Um, the same way that you unit test your server code, um, you know, using JUnit, and so you can build your test harnesses really uh, in in one environment as opposed to trying to do it in multiple environments. So um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. We'll talk about a lot of these things during the course of the quarter anyway. Um, but uh, but I definitely uh, you know want to let you know ahead of time that we're going to look at a, a bunch of different things, but we're not necessarily each individually going to work on all of them. Um, so, you know, thinking about things that you might want to do during the course of the quarter, um, there's, uh, you know, various modules that you, you might want to write uh, 
for you know doing secure logins, uh, sending email out to users, building a user profile, linking users together, um, and then uh, connecting to various other uh, APIs uh, out there. And then um, if you're interested in experimenting with how to uh, build a business around your uh, your code, you could do some tests on how to how to get your code to work uh, within um, within the Google search engine or you know how to get advertising up on your uh, uh, on your pr on your code mm -hmm. so these are these are things that you might want to consider uh, you know writing uh, a basic you know a basic version of during the course of the quarter and um, so one of the things that I'd like to do in a sort of collaborative way with all of you guys is uh, figure out, um, you know, what are the types of things you're interested in. So I'd, I'd love to get, you know, uh, basically a short email from, uh, you know, all of you uh, individually with a couple of the things you're interested in. And if any of these, uh, you know, types of projects are interesting to you, which are the ones you might be interested in. Um, and... Uh, so that we can really uh, understand uh, which types of problems you might want to work on during the course of the quarter, uh, because it's my conviction that you know uh, together we can we can build something that that is kind of interesting during the course of the quarter, and it doesn't. And the way we're going to coordinate that is through myself and and the CAs in the class. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of other projects. I just listed, you know, a, about a dozen things that we might be interested in looking at. But I'd also welcome uh, in that email from you guys, uh, you know, any suggestions you have, uh, you know, things that aren't on this list. Um, and the first thing that I'd like for you guys to, to look at is... Um, Basically, setting up uh, the Google plugin for Eclipse, setting up Subversion if you don't already have it running on your uh, machine. And if, uh, if you can find an easy way to, to use and maintain Git, <laughs> I'd love to know of it. Uh, I, you know, I <laughs> um, and, and again, uh, it should be uh, somewhat cross-platform uh, you know, for Mac, uh, Linux, and Windows users. Um, get an App Engine account. Test out the sample GUID application, and for extra credit, you could also, uh, uh, you know, push the application out to the uh, uh, App Engine uh, servers just to 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 iterate on that. So um, this isn't something that's going to be graded, but it's I'm I'm hoping just going to be the the foundation of uh, what you're going to do during the course of the quarter. Okay, so I think actually that I'm running a little bit ahead of uh, my self-imposed schedule, but uh, what I'd like to do is take a little bit of time to, uh, to do some Q&A since this is the first class, and I've thrown a lot of stuff at you, so uh, instead of, you know, uh, me spitting out more stuff that was unsolic unsolicited, I'd love to, you know, hear from you guys. Uh, if uh, you know you have any suggestions on what you'd like to build, or if you'd have any ideas on what type of open source license you'd, you're more, you know most interested in, um, and then maybe you know spend some time talking about scalability uh, in the real world. And uh, so I'd. Windows. And Max, anyone using Linux? Okay. Um, also, are any of you going to be using university computing? Yeah, actually, Instead that's an of important having one. Your own personal computers. Because it's fine if you do, but well, we'll just have to set up a couple extra things for you. Oh, nice. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Uh, All right. We might get a CD. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, for uh, anybody in uh, SCPD land out there, if uh, you can let me know if you're planning to use university uh, computers or resources, 
uh, during the quarter, please let me know. Uh, send me an email. Uh, go ahead. Explain a little bit more about the project. Like, are we building modules as a part of one large project as a class, or are we like building individual modules ourselves? Like you said. So, um, the the real goal during the course of the quarter is to spend some time, you know, building some software on your own and then integrating it uh, with software uh, that you're your classmates have developed. And I actually uh, think that the integration part is possibly going to be the, m the more interesting thing. Um, I found that um, the most productive people in the companies I worked at were always the people who uh, could glue a lot of things together. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk a lot about things like mashups uh, early on in the, in the quarter because I think this is, that's sort of the area where you get experience gluing things together. And uh, I'd like to make that uh, a f you know, one of the focuses of the, of the development during the course of the quarter. So yes, uh, uh, ultimately, you know, uh, one, one big software uh, project out of lots of small ones is the goal. Uh, yeah, I guess that was, so just to clarify, it would be like someone builds an email module and someone else builds a user module. It's not going to be like we each build our own website with APIs and other people use those APIs to do whatever. That's right. Yeah, it's more, it's more about building you know, parts of a website that you can integrate with uh, your uh, classmates. But my, my feeling, my goal is that, um, is that everybody's individual project is kind of a self-standing website at some level. You know, it may not do a whole lot. It only does you know, certain functions but it can be combined together with other people's code to make a more powerful website. Um, I'm a, a strong believer in sort of that uh, accretive mode of software development where you get something, a minimal bit of software working, and you build on top of that. And you never try to leave the state of having a functional website or a functional piece of software. Go ahead. Entire website, like as a whole, as a class, like that can be decided by the ideas we send in, or something. Yeah, like. yeah. So I definitely like for this to be a, a participative project. Um, you know, I I don't want to um, lead by fiat. <laughs> I'd love to learn what you guys are interested in, and come up with a project or a larger project that's based on your individual interests, um, because I think that uh, you know. I really want you to feel engaged in whatever it is that you're writing uh, during the course of the quarter and that you feel like it's relevant to some software that you'd like for yourself afterwards. Um, you have a question. Uh, I was going to ask to clarify that at the end all will be from the same repository, we'll just the, the whole class will have the same. Um, well, that's actually, right, that's actually one of the reasons why I was, uh, you know, hoping to find someone who was a, a Git uh, expert <laughs> who could uh, uh, set things up in such a way that we could each have our own, you know, our own branch. That use oh yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely love to use one of the um, uh, the repositories out there, either you know Google Source or GitHub. Um, um, so at you know some point early on in the quarter, we'll we'll set that up. Um. So will it likely be smaller teams of say two or three or four people working together? Or yeah, you I think y you can work individually if, if you like. Um, I would expect that if you're working individually that you actually spend more time integrating your code with other people's code. Uh, or, you know, work in groups of two or three. Um, I, I really want you to feel like, um, you know, you're collaborating as, a, as an entire class. So. Uh, any kind of communication that you have outside of your uh, uh, outside of your projects is is great, uh, and I want to foster that. So the grading is going to be done in a somewhat dif different way than for a lot of other courses you might have taken at Stanford. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, you say the teams uh, kind of build web services which other teams uh, leverage or something like that. Absolutely. I mean, if the, if that's the if that's the structure that you want to take, but. 
I, I definitely encourage you to have something uh, like a front, if you build a service, have a little front end to the service that shows how it works. You know, so that it's not just a, a module that's sitting, you know, that, that's unavailable until someone builds the UI for it or something like that. So the final uh, scheme of integrating with others would be decided, uh, would be unique and which others have to uh, get to or something like that, I mean, which you will decide. Well, so uh, during the integration project, what I would imagine that you'd want to do is, is uh, take a look at what other people have developed, and we'll sort of bring that up. Uh, I'll you know, make sure that people know what other people are developing. And then uh, that you talk to uh, the, the, you know, the, the groups or individuals who are responsible for the projects you were most interested in, and find a way to connect your code to theirs. So you don't have to connect your code to everyone else's but you choose some subset of, say, two or three other projects and figure out how to do it. Just to make it concrete, let's just uh, show someone's going to write the login module. Mm -hmm. That seems like it needs to connect to everything. Sure. How, how well, so there, there are a couple of uh, projects that I, I don't mind if you know, multiple people implement or that there be multiple projects that do them. Um, so, so some of the core, you know, like data, and say, you know, login modules, maybe we'd have even two or three different groups uh, developing. Um, yep. Um, so I have general logistical questions about the class. Mm -hmm. So are the PowerPoints going to be posted yeah. online? OK. Yeah, so um, I'll, um, I'll bring up the, the slide with the website, and I'll just be pushing the PDFs um, to the, the course website uh, on a regular basis. Class sessions going to be organized sort of similarly to this, where you're talking about higher level topics and referring us to places, and then it's up to us to like look up the instructions for how to set up SVN or whatever other services well, you're pointing us to. So I, I definitely like your feedback on uh, like all of your feedback on that. Um, uh, I I tend to when I present things, I tend to sort of go deep into abstractions. Uh, that's a, a flaw of mine, <laughs> rather than a gift, perhaps. So uh, if I need to dig you know, into more detail and, and uh, get very specific about how to do things, uh, I, you know, I'd, I'd love that kind of feedback from you guys. Um, um, and then are there going to be tasks, sort of like this one, every class, or so, that varies? Um, so actually, the, the task that I put up was uh, one of the five bullets from an early earlier slide. So there's really only two sort of uh, set up tasks in some sense. Uh, one for Eclipse and the second one would be for Cruise Control, um, which is the continuous integration uh, server. And are you unveiling the course content by, cor by class, or do you have plans to show the next like three weeks? Um, by uh, well, I can, I can definitely try to give a more detailed description of what's coming. Um, uh, but I, I tend to sort of do kind of just-in-time development for, <laughs> for myself. And the reason, the reason for that is that uh, because I tend to be pretty abstract, uh, I, I love getting your feedback and improving what I do based on you know, what you're telling me. So what you're telling me now is that actually there are a number of things that I can possibly do to adjust my slides for the coming uh, sessions. Uh, I can give a, a rough idea of the things we're going to cover in the next few weeks. Um, yep. So I just got into actions for programming for like client side stuff. Mm -hmm. um, where does that fall into like your position on open source software for the course? Um, you mean like whether or not to do it or? Yeah. Um, well. I actually, I'm, I'm kind of one of the most sort of like software agnostic people I know. <laughs> um, so if, if you really want to do an ap action script project, uh, you want to figure out how to encapsulate it in such a way that you know, other people can connect to it uh, properly. Um, the, the, the downsides, I would say, is again that you're going to have to um, uh, set up uh, testing methods that are separate from the testing methods that you would use for any of the other software that you write. And um, so, uh, 
you, you can you know think of it from that perspective. Um, I'm I'm hoping that you know you, you get enough uh, uh, contact with you know GUIT and and other bits of software during the course of the quarter that you you, f you start to feel really interested in <laughs> in developing on those platforms instead. Um, let's see. Back to project ideas. If you were going to start a company, what would you do next? <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, actually, I, I sort of revealed my hand uh, in, in one of the early slides where I said that you know I think the mobile web is is exciting. Um, so, the like I've been brainstorming with a couple of friends on um, uh, you know, augmented reality type uh, things, and I, I'm really fascinated with that. So the the concept that you know you can basically um, have your phone and, and wander around uh, looking at various things and, your, and then the compute cycles are used to bring data from, your, from servers that give you additional information about what you're looking at. So if you're a sightseer, it could point out uh, you know, points of interest dynamically as you're walking along. Or if you're looking for a bar, um, you can find the bar where more, more of your friends are hanging out at. Um, so uh, that's kind of been the stuff that's gotten me most interested in uh, in coding lately. <laughs> and uh, all of this stuff actually is still germane to that, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, I definitely, you know, love to talk to you a little bit more about <laughs> those things uh, uh, separately uh, offline. But, uh, yeah. So I'm really excited about the fact that s the small computing devices that we have in our pockets have lots of sensors that you know sense the real world around us and um, allow us to actually you know do really cool things with uh, that sensing capability. Um, so I guess in terms of scaling, one of the things I'm most interested in learning about is. Um, uh, you know, setting up a, a server architecture or a network of servers architecture mm -hmm. which can handle high amounts of traffic. But it sounds like the project projects that will be done in this class won't, I mean, at least within the life cycle of this course, not have time to get exposure to high traffic. So, oh, that's right. And so I'm, I'm wondering, sort of, I mean, is there an approach to teaching this material that can sort of prove the concepts? Mm -hmm. Without the actual high traffic, right? So, um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so, uh, um, basically, you know, I can I can talk a little bit about performance testing. Um, what I found, what I found at all of the companies I've worked at is that we keep running into you know engineering problems that we couldn't possibly have anticipated when we started out. So I don't, I don't think there's a magic bullet that, you know, I can, like, spend a week talking about building a server architecture um, that won't run into problems. But I definitely do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, um, uh, like, a, a data architecture that's worked uh, really well. Um, and the one I developed for iMeme. And so we can... We can look at that one and say, you know, these are the types of things that, that matter for, you know, back-end scalability. Um, and so if you're not going to rely on using Amazon's AWS or Google's App Engine to scale your service, um, and you're going to use, um, you know, co-location center and, and your own servers, these are the types of things you might look at. Yeah. Um. All right. So, um, any other questions? Maybe I'll just move forward to a couple other things. Um, so, here are a couple of links I've put up, um, you know, just to help, uh, you know, if, if you want, if you want to look a little bit further at some of the things I talked about today, uh, these are places to look. Um, and uh, you know, if you want to get started right away on the code, um, you can you can Google the Google plugin and find the the link. <laughs> um, yeah. So I thought I'd just spend a little bit of time also talking about you know uh, where I come from and 
uh, why um, the things that I can talk about, you know, may <laughs> may possibly help uh, get you started where, wherever you're going to go. So I did get a, a PhD at Stanford in computer science um, and basically started working full time um, uh, even before I defended my uh, orals um, in 1999 and, well, actually starting already summer of 1998, uh, you know, right in the middle of the dot-com boom and um, been out there in industry ever since. And uh, I kind of always wished that there was a class that, um, you know, to taught me a little bit about what would be useful once I got out into the real world uh, while I was still in academia. <laughs> because a lot of the things that I think that I learned once I got into the real world were much more interesting and exciting to me than some of the things that I was looking at while I was in school. Um, but even before getting into computer science, I, I've lived a little bit uh, all over the world and um, gotten a deep appreciation for uh, communication as one of the most important things that, that connects people. and. Uh, uh, which is kind of odd because I was a very shy person growing up. But, <laughs> but uh, I lived in, I've lived in Africa and Congo. I've lived in Europe and Switzerland. Uh, lived in Japan for four years and uh, lived both on the East Coast and West Coast. And uh, finally now, actually, the Bay Area is the, the one place I've lived the longest in my life. And uh, it's probably, uh, you know, where, where I'll settle down. Uh, I don't see any likelihood of changing that. So I think we live in a very privileged area, and I think that the access to uh, great minds and you know great climate and uh, lots of really interesting people is one of the things that makes uh, the Bay Area just you know so special to me. Um, I've also uh, been involved in sports, and um, I will only mention this as an aside, but. For me, um, sports is one of the things that helped me get through school and uh, helped me sort of have the discipline to do all of the things it takes to graduate. Um, and I've kept at it since I graduated. So uh, instead of uh, flipping out in front of a computer screen, I flip out uh, over, uh, over, over water <laughs> in a diving pool. Yeah. Um, and uh, recently I became a, a father and it's unbelievable how many things I've learned uh, about, you know, being patient um, and about sort of uh, iterating on things since becoming a father. Uh, <laughs> so I, I actually, um, you know, I'm one of these guys that, that uh, you know, takes anything useful I've learned and try to apply it to everything in my life. So uh, uh, I have uh, twin daughters, and when they learn to code, I'm going to see if they want to uh, do pair programming. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've talked about, um, you know, agile software development, and uh, I think extreme programming is very interesting, but one of the things that I think is a really difficult thing for people to deal with when they look at extreme programming is the concept of pair programming and always working together with somebody. And I think one of the reasons that it's so hard is because um, you, you don't start coding that way, you know. Uh, most, most of us probably have, you know, started writing code as individuals, um, you know, and spent many hours on our own writing stuff that we never expected anyone else to look at. And it's hard to go from, you know, that mode of thinking about how I, you know, uh, write a piece of code and uh, something like pair programming. And I think that, that in general, uh, one of the big jumps that I took when I went into industry um, was that all of a sudden I realized that coding was for other people, not really for me. Um, even the source code that I wrote. And I think that open source is one of the best places to explore those concepts. Because um, the best open source projects are the ones where um, you know, the code that's written is something that a lot of people look at and a lot of people sort of integrate the ideas from. And so if you think about, you know, uh, popular novelists um, and the, the books they write that millions of people read, uh, you could also look at, you know, popular software developers from the standpoint of, 
um, how many times their code gets downloaded and used and, and uh, updated. And so uh, I definitely you know, think that a lot of those experiences um, are relevant to you know, where I'm standing today. And hopefully, I can make them relevant and useful to you uh, during the course of the quarter. So um, if there are any other questions, I'd love to answer them. And I think we can wrap up for the, this class. Anything? All right. Thanks a lot. How's it going? Good. So I'm Mike. I sent an email to you yesterday. Oh, okay. Got it. Um,